50% of Americans are not even training. Far and away, we have arguably the biggest health crisis with our population. People always point to the blue zones. They say, well, yes, in the blue do. zones, they have like a shot of vodka every night and they're socially connected and they have a Mediterranean diet. You know, part of the reason why we are requiring this higher protein load is because we are physically less active. It's the case now that I try and hit each muscle group directly once per week and then indirectly another day per week. So if legs are on Monday, the in, that's direct. and then But the indirect leg training is actually the hit workout on Friday, sprinting. As See, I, I love it, that. That's wonderful. Yeah. I think that the um, three days per week whole body workout, I think would work for a lot of people just to take the complexity out of it. Um, so is it the case that the entire workout could be um, constrained to 45 to 60 minutes? Absolutely. And for a new lifter, they're going to get the most gains. What we find is that an, if an individual is what we would consider a beginner, you will see, um, you know, after they go through a neural, um, a neurological adaptation is that they will get more um, growth and potentially progress. A new lifter could progress weekly. Whereas a more advanced lifter, I would say we would be considered more advanced. We've been lifting our whole lives. That for us to make changes, um, it's it's much more challenging for us to put on size or uh, even get stronger. I mean, yes, there is a particular cadence, but our improvements might be minute. And when you're thinking about designing a program, the current recommendations uh, for physical activity, which by the way, do you know, 75, uh, roughly 70 Maybe it's 78% of individuals do not meet physical activity guidelines. And what are those again? 5,000 uh, steps per day? 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity with two days a week of resistance training. Per week? Yeah. So 150 minutes. Total. And two days a week of resistance Plus training. Plus two days a week of resistance yeah. training. Um, so that is what? Th uh, 30 minutes, seven days a week of activity. Just to put that into perspective, that is how sedentary we are. 50% of Americans are not even training. Far and away, we have arguably the biggest health crisis with our population. People always point to the blue zones. They say, well, yes, in the they blue do. zones, they have like a shot of vodka every night and they're socially connected and they have a Mediterranean diet and they're not lifting weights. But is it the case that they are um, piling wood um, are they walking more? Um, are they highly carrying? Active. Okay. Highly active. And the blue zones are a, a funny thing because, um, you know, some will say, well, are the, the records kept appropriately and, and et cetera. There is um, a lot, though, despite that, that we can learn from the blue zones. And I think, again, the uh, connection, social, socialization, but also movement. You know, part of the reason why we are requiring this higher protein load is because we are physically less active. Again, there's only two main ways to stimulate skeletal muscle, resistance training and dietary protein. Arguably, the resistance training piece, the physical activity piece is more influential, is much more impactful to full body homeostasis than diet will ever be. If you just eat protein and don't exercise, you will likely still lose muscle. Interesting. My observation of family friends um, that include people who are very fit into their 80s and 90s, and even beyond in a few cases, are that, and here these are uh, generalizations based on observation, I want to be clear, that the people I know who are still skiing in their 80s who are, who are yeah. sprinting in their 80s you know not as fast as they used to who are still playing tennis um in their 80s so what i'm referring to here are people that are playing sports that involve dynamic movement that involve a lot of coordination and no doubt some resistance um at least of some sort like skiing is you know there's some resistance involved uh, depending on the complexity of the, trees, of the slope etc yeah, yeah and trees so um, what do you think is going on there? I mean, there's a rich literature su to support the fact that most of our brain volume is there to support vision and movement. movement. And that when we move less, there's brain atrophy. Um, John Rady at Harvard talked a lot about this, even some species of animals that will spend part of their life swimming around and then they'll nest on a rock and then the brain will actually eat itself <laughs> due to the lack of movement. It will just metabolize uh, portions of itself. So the relationship between movement and brain health 
um, seems seems obvious, but um, yeah, how many folks do you see out there in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s that are now doing resistance training? Do we know the percentages on um, that? I don't. And I was just recently looking at the ACSM guidelines, which is the American College of Sports Medicine, um, for activity and in older individuals. I am not sure the percentage of individuals that are actually doing resistance training. And partially, um, I'd have to believe that it's less. So again, I trained as a geriatrician. And one of the things that we always saw, not for everybody, but for the majority of people, is it wasn't the duration of the training. They were still, if they were active, they were still active. It was the intensity mm. that they were able to mount. And so because, you know, there's this interesting thing is, as we age, well, I mean, some of us are less intense in our training. And it's the actual intensity piece that seems to go down that when this can be addressed, and what do I mean by intensity? Um, there's a million ways in which I suppose one could define intensity, but it is pushing themselves again. Are we going to say, is it how many reps, how heavy? But the focus and the intensity of the training goes down. I guess we could define intensity somewhat loosely, but still fairly by saying, you know, repetitions in the, what, you know, five to 10, maybe 12 repetition range where the final two or three repetitions are challenging um, in good form, right? Maybe even to failure in good form. Does, well, that, does that seem well, like fair? Yeah, yeah and, I, and I would think of the intensity component because the aging literature it really doesn't seem to matter if people are lifting heavy or light. I used to believe that in order to maintain skeletal muscle mass, especially as hormonal status changes, decrease in testosterone, decrease in estrogen, decrease in progesterone, that the heaviness of the load has to increase. I can't, the data doesn't necessarily support that. I would love for that to be the case. Mm -hmm. Surprising to me. I it would is think, surprising. I would think people would have to push themselves with not extremely heavy loads, but moderately heavy for them. So it was surprising to me as well. And especially when we worked on some of those earlier studies in layman's lab, there's this change in body composition that seems to happen midlife. There's an increase in visceral body fat um, or central adiposity. And one would think that you require a lot of extra uh, supplements, et cetera, to influence that. But when training and nutrition are accounted for in a very controlled way, body composition changes to the positive. You can lose body fat and increase muscle mass. It'll be very interesting to see as the literature around hormone replacement continues to evolve, especially as it relates to women, because we know that testosterone improves skeletal muscle mass. Um, but that isn't going to be enough if you don't have the foundation the foundation in place. Muscle quality right now is defined purely on functional movement measurements, but that's clearly not it. When we define, if you look in the literature, muscle quality is really about the load and the weight and the performance, not about the architecture and the infrastructure of the skeletal muscle. And the reason I say this, let, let me take a step back, is that in the literature, and you will often hear people say that only strength matters, size doesn't matter. I don't believe that to be true. I believe that we haven't been able to test muscle size appropriately. 